Hello there YouTubes, we are jumping into another pre-release guide with Innistrad Midnight Hunt. This is our third trip to Innistrad visiting this land of vampires and werewolves and humans that transform into werewolves. Everything is frightening, hope is dwindling for Innistrad inhabitants trying to survive this midnight hunt because the werewolves are hungry and on the prowl. But I hope you're as excited as I am to jump into some pre-release goodness. In this guide I'll go through the mechanics, the archetypes, and then end with deck building and gameplay tips to help you take down your pre-release. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions before, and of course, come back after your pre-release and tell me how it went. And please hit that like button, it really helps me out and gets YouTube recommending my videos more to people that enjoy this kind of content. I put a lot of time and effort into these to make sure they are the most concise, most information-packed ones on the YouTubes. Hitting that like button and subscribing really does go a long way. Thank you. Now, diving into the mechanics, first we have the Daybound and Nightbound keywords. We of course have humans transforming into werewolves, but now the transitioning is based on this new keyword mechanic. Daybound says if a player casts no spells during their turn, at the start of the next turn it becomes night. Nightbound says if a player casts two or more spells during their turn, it becomes day to start the next turn. Meaning, if it's day on your turn, you cast no spells, it becomes night at the start of your opponent's turn, even if your opponent casts spells during your turn. Because it is only looking at the player whose turn it is, when it comes to checking how many spells were or were not cast. The other important thing to remember is if it is night and you play a card with Nightbound, it enters the battlefield transformed. You do not have to wait for it to go back to day and then night for it to transform again. It just enters as the Nightbound transformed side. Clear as mud, great. Next is Disturb. You may cast a card with Disturb from your graveyard for its Disturb cost. When you do, it ETBs as the transformed side this is most common among blue and white spells and usually results in a flying spirit creature that when it dies is exiled, probably because it's just tired of being disturbed. Then there's Coven. Not Coven, it's Coven. Only a dum-dum would think it's pronounced like Cove with an N on the end, you know? <laughs> okay, Coven's a new mechanic. Anyway, Coven requires you to have three or more creatures with different power and then you can either trigger or activate the Coven ability. This is most often found on the humans in the set as they work together to fight off the werewolves who are trying to hunt them down. They are coven together to survive the midnight hunt. It's a bad pun, but it checks out. Moving on to another keyword, decayed. Decayed means the creature cannot block, and when they attack, they are sacrificed at the end of combat. This is showing up on all of our zombie tokens, but also can be something creatures have when they return zombified from the graveyard or exile. So they can still get in for damage, and if you have a way to sacrifice them before combat's over, that can be a nice way to get some extra value from them. One more effect, this isn't a mechanic, but some vampires in this set gain additional abilities or have an additional ETB effect if an opponent lost life this turn. And lastly, we have Flashback and Investigate returning in the set too. That's it for the mechanics. It's a lot to digest, but we'll be revisiting them as we go through the archetypes, so do not fret if you're still trying to wrap your head around everything we just went through. Moving on to the archetypes and our color pairs, in this set, all 10 dual color pairings work, and all of the archetypes revolve around some combination of the mechanics we just reviewed and the main creature types we find on Innistrad, which are humans, werewolves, vampires and geists or spirits, zombies, and the timeless witches and warlocks. Okay, moving into the archetypes, let's go in color pairing order, starting with blue-white, which is disturbed spirits. The problem we are trying to solve is how do we keep up with the more aggro decks, or decayed zombie hordes growing on the ground. Aggro flyers is probably not going to be an option, especially in sealed, so if you're playing blue-white at your pre-release, you need a good early game to come up the board and then have enough flyers to win the race through the air. Three or more toughness will be huge for us in those early plays as well to wall up against aggro attackers. Beloved Beggar, our Beach Sand Sifter, and Adeline are perfect early plays for us to build that defense against those early attackers. Then our offense can be built using flashing flyers and spirits or our disturbed creatures in the graveyard who we had to use to trade away. They're all ready for that second round where we strike back. Using these frightening geists makes blocking for our opponent a real pain. Then as we get into the mid and late game, ideally you have a couple flyers that can continue to get in, and when our opponent plays their big bombs or creatures that would help them win the race, being in blue and white, we should have no problem having an answer for a couple of those bigger spells. My last comment on this archetype is I like the amount of instants and flashing creatures we have because it can help us play around those daybound, nightbound keywords in the way that best benefits us. 
On our turn, we can pass to make sure it gets to night, and then during our opponent's turn, still be able to add to our board flashing in creatures and ensuring that whatever time of day it is, is best for us. It's one of the more cerebral archetypes in the set, but one that can certainly hang with anyone. Next is white-black, which is sacrifices must be made, and with the sacrifice or deaths happening, we make sure our opponent gets the shorter end of the stick. The problem we need to solve here is not getting outscaled. Our early game plays are quite good though, and often can scale into that mid and late game. Unruly Mob can get out of hand in a short amount of time. Morbid Opportunist keeps us drawing cards, which is huge and limited, and Concealed Cut Purse can help us remove some big threat we don't have removal for. But then of course, with us being white and black, we have a solid amount of removal, Foul Play gets small stuff, Defenestrate gets non-flying stuff, and Eaten Alive exiles anything that's gotten too big to handle. We'll see more removal in the other archetypes, but just know, in black especially, there's a ton of removal. Then our best bombs and scaling plays are creatures like Slaughter Specialist, which will get bigger as the game goes on, Odrix Outrider, which also helps other stuff grow, and Liesa will win us games on her own because she's, she's just that good. White-Black is quite aggro in this set, with no fear of things dying. They bring the ability to start applying pressure early, and it's always nice when your early plays can scale into that mid and late game. I mean, if you have a good balance of creatures and removal in your sealed pool, I suspect this will be a solid color pair that a lot of people do take down their pre-release with. Now, White-Red is also pretty aggro and is focused on the day-night transformations as much as anyone. They are the day and night watchers. Early on, we want to curve out into plays like Chaplain of Alms, Spellrune Painter, and Brutal Cathar. I mean, this card, when it ETBs or transforms back into Brutal Cathar, it exiles a creature for as long as he sticks around, which is brutal and is a card your opponent will have to remove ASAP, especially if you have enough spells to keep the day and night thing bounding along. Then mid-game is where we really take off. Reckless Stormseeker, Tavern Ruffian, and Village Watch all keep us applying a lot of pressure with creatures that are not easily dealt with in combat. Red also brings some good damage-based removal spells, as they always do, with my new favorite in this set being Play With Fire. And of course, the damage-based spells always play really well with Rem, who's also helping us be aggro and keep our stuff around. This color pair, it doesn't feel super unique or different from what we've seen before in other sets, but will be a great option for those card pools that have a really low curve and want to focus or go all in on aggro. And remember, if it is night, your nightbound creatures enter transform, so that's another way to really add some heavy hitters to the battlefield and close out games quick. Now white green is humans coven together. We are creating a lot of tokens, we are rallying around our savior Sigarda, and doing whatever it takes to fight back against the big bad werewolves. Our problem we want to solve here is keeping our synergy pieces around and making sure that our wide board doesn't get wiped out or overrun by all the things that go bump in the night on Innistrad. Adeline is another great early play that helps build out our board, as well as other token generators like Dawnheart Mentor and Join the Dance. A wide board is the gold more often than not, and then building it up with another gold card we have like Katilda. And with that wide board, we should have no problem activating Coven to give our creatures maybe trample or more power or just adding more counters to what's on the board. You can see how having a wide board that activates Coven can quickly make even those 1-1 tokens into big problems for our opponent. Just make sure to always keep those three different power levels around because losing Coven could sink the ship pretty quick. But once you get a decent board going, we also have some nice removal options and combat tricks to keep our mob getting in for damage. If you like going wide and building an army, this is the color pair you'll enjoy most. Or blue-black could also be the answer to your token-making dreams, because here we're focused on zombie beatdown. We know black has no shortage of removal, with another card, Infernal Grasp, being the best uncommon removal spell in the set. Poppet Stitcher makes a 2-2 zombie with decay every time you cast an instant or sorcery. Once you have three or more during your upkeep, it turns into a factory, and now all your creature tokens are 3-3s three and no longer have decay. Then Tainted Adversary is a fine early game play, but the later the game goes, the more mana you hopefully have, which allows you to summon a crazy big zombie horde when he ETBs. If you open both of these in the same pool, well, who am I kidding, you'll probably not have much else and wind up in green-white or something. Besides the mythics though, what are some other nice zombie creators and synergies? There's no better turn one play than Champion of the Perished, who will undoubtedly grow to be huge if unchecked. Maybe you're lucky enough to team him up with Jadar, or even some of our better common creatures like Falcon Abomination or Hobbling Zombie. The problem we have to solve is how do we get the most value from these decaying zombies? We can look to our other gold card, Corpse Cobble, which is probably one of my favorite named cards in the entire set, and a fantastic way to make use of all those zombies. 
turning them into some unstoppable zombie monster instead. Or we have Ludovic, another bomb for this color pair, and is a creature that will take over any game if he transforms, becoming another large, probably unstoppable zombie creature. That's the gist. Play spells which accidentally create zombies, disrupt your opponent's play, and find that path to victory, however cobbled together it may be. Moving into blue-red, it is the classic, the timeless, and maybe a little boring spells matter. It likes when you cast those instants and sorceries, and to be honest, is probably the most straightforward game plan for anyone familiar with how blue-red usually works. The one caveat we see from our gold cards is that we also benefit from the day and night changes, which then helps us cast our instants and sorceries. The red adversary is also here to give us some crazy good value, as they all do in the set, this time letting us recast one or potentially multiple of our mana value three or less spells for free from our graveyard. And then Smoldering Egg is a very good early blocker that then transforms into a 4-4 dragon that is shockingly good in the air. Another couple cards I like in red are Obsessive Astronomer and Cathartic Pyre, which both let us pitch cards we don't need to dig for better spells. As much as I give blue and red flack for not having the most unique game plan, that doesn't mean it's not effective. Cards like Sunstreak Phoenix can be impossible for our opponent to deal with permanently. Thermo Alchemist can win close games if you've ever had the joy of trying to survive as pinging while dealing with bigger problems. And Blue has a one-mana plan ruiner to fade that last bit of hope of our opponent. It's a fun game plan for people that want to have flexibility in being able to answer any opponent threat or find a way to grind out a win. But you probably end up here because the card quality you have in red and blue is just too good to ignore. Now, blue-green is, believe it or not, the most focused on self-mill and flashback. Root Coil Creeper helps us splash or ramp into flashback spells, and since there's a bit of flashback everywhere, we can then utilize all those powerful spells we have in our card pool and have the best top end possible. I wouldn't fault anyone for also playing 18 lands here because we will often be able to cast the spells we do play more often than once, and the more mana we have, the more we can play. If we're lucky enough to have our frog token creator, we can copy a creature with the best abilities on either side of the battlefield. Our Disciple of the Drowned gives everything flashback, and because most things with flashback cost more when they're in the graveyard, we can actually use her ability to flash it back for cheaper. Storm the Festival is seriously an awful card. I would not recommend anyone play it. Why? Because for how expensive it is, the fact that you can even whiff for it is demoralizing, and it's probably going to be an underwhelming hit regardless. Memory Deluge, Otherworldly Gaze help us draw cards, but also get cards into our graveyard to flash back later. Then Ominous Roost I like, but I'm a little wary on here because the tokens only block creatures with flying. But if you've got good creatures in play on the ground, then those 1-1 flyers can be your win con in the air. Just make sure you have enough flashback in your deck to make it worth it, which shouldn't be difficult because there's like 40 cards with flashback in the set. Then Slogurk, the Overslime, is one of the biggest payoffs we have for self-milling or discarding lands. If it has three or more 1-1 one -one counters on it, then it provides itself some pseudo-protection from removal. This archetype is our potential five-color fun stuff build because every color pair has some flashback, and then as you get into the mid and late game, you should, again, have the highest top end to be able to take down whatever your opponent's puny two-color deck is doing. Switching gears to black-red, which is aggro vampires, Florian really captures the spirit of what we're trying to do here, which is getting our opponent to lose life and then benefiting from that life loss. The goal here is finding a way to continue getting in for damage. If we do, Stormkirk Blood Thief will be very good because it adds a 1-1 counter on every one of our end steps, and Famished Foragers hopefully helps us ramp into another nice spell or creature, with an ideal option being Oldair and Ambusher to then remove something on your opponent's side of the board. Vampire Socialite also helps us deal damage having Menace, and then helping all of our other vampires ETB with an additional 1-1 counter on it, which in Limited can be huge. Even adding a couple counters onto other creatures can swing a board state. Smaller plays like Falconrath Perforator, Vampire Interloper, and Valderan Stinger can be those ways we poke in for damage as well, which is very important in this archetype. I think this color pair, if it curves out well and it goes unchecked, even for a few turns, will have the quickest wins in the set. But if they stumble early or lose the ability to get in for damage, they can really flounder or wind up with a lot of underpowered creatures who quickly get outscaled. Vengeful Strangler, it's a 2-1 that can't block, so we're attacking with it every turn. And if they don't block it, they take 2 damage, and now our vampires are happy. If they do block it, and most likely it dies, then your opponent will have their biggest creature enchanted by its transformed side. Which now says, on our upkeep, they either have to sacrifice a non-land permanent, or they lose 1 life. Which also makes all of our vampires really happy. We can also use removal and combat tricks like Lunar Frenzy, Moon Rager Slash, and Olivia's Midnight Ambush to keep getting in for damage. And having so many instant speed interactions is how we keep our opponent on their back foot. 
But if we can't aggro them down and we can't keep getting in for damage, well, then these vampires kind of suck. Black Green, on the other hand, well, they have an undergrowth theme going on and they want creatures in the graveyard. Old Stick Fingers here is a bomb in the mid to late game. I don't love milling only creatures to my graveyard, especially in this set, and I don't really want to play him in the early game, but hopefully you draw him in the mid to late game where he's a 6-6 for 2 mana. Ghoul Caller's Harvest is another great 2 mana spell that can add a lot of power to the board, although it is in the form of 2-2 two -two decaying zombies. Or we can use those creatures in the graveyard as, well I think of them like fertilizer for our fungus friend here. Death Bonnet Sprout is a 1-1 one -one that mills a card for us on our upkeep and will eventually transform, and then it uses those creatures in any graveyard to just keep on growing. Lord of the Forsaken I guess is a nice top end play for us as a 6-6 six -six flampler, but the way cooler thing is if we can make tokens and then use those to mill our opponent out. I mean, it's a 6-6 six -six Flampler though, so it's a, uh, yeah, things shouldn't take that long. But let's say we don't have a Broken Mythic. Something else we can do is just drain our opponent out. Baneblade Scoundrel is a pain to block, but when it's transformed, is bigger, and when creatures blocking it die, drains our opponent of one. Whenever any creature dies or is milled into a graveyard, Dreadhound, besides being a 6-6, six -six, also has our opponent lose a life. And Curse of Leeches drains our opponent for one on their upkeep, or becomes a 4-4 lifelink leech just to speed up the process. We've got ways to mill cards, Diagraph Rebirth, make sure we can get those critical creatures back if they wind up in the graveyard where we don't want them, and Grizzly Ghoul is one of the best 4 drops in the set, having Trample, and in all likelihood entering as the biggest thing on the board. Oh, and Willowgeist is a spicy 1 drop that can grow, and I always like things having Trample. This color pair feels like it can be a bit unfocused, but it also feels like as long as you're playing spells, in some way, shape, or form, you're putting your opponent on a clock. Whether it be from big old tramplers or just the slow draining of their life, this archetype can be kind of annoying to deal with. And then lastly, a color pair that never wins slowly because they're trying to burn down the house, red-green werewolves. We got Arlen, our favorite werewolf planeswalker. We want it to be night and stay night, though, so our big bodies can enter even bigger. And this has been the theme of this color pair in every Innistrad set. Big, bad werewolves. Hound Tamer is great even as a mana sink. Its flip side gives all of our other Midnight Hunting Wolves trample. Kessig Naturalist, not sure how much I'm buying the name because that seems way more peaceful than he actually is. Transforms into a nice wolf anthem type creature. And Village Watch, when transformed, gives all of our furry friends haste. And then the best werewolf in the set, Tovlar, will keep us drawing cards on either side. But if it's nighttime and he's his werewolf self, he's essentially a Kessig wolf run, allowing us to sink extra mana into more trampling damage. He's just really good, as is his mono green Huntmaster. This archetype is for the purists in the format who want the werewolf nostalgia you can only get from Innistrad and you can only get in red and green. Just make sure you have a good curve, time your interactions well, and be ready to howl at the moon in victory. Even if you get some weird looks, I'm sure there'll be some who appreciate your commitment to your deck. Okay, that's it for the archetypes. Now, I subtly mentioned keep splashing in mind, and that's because there's 43 gold cards in the set, with each dual color pairing having at least four. A lot of them play well in other color pairs, so don't discount them just because they don't line up exactly with the two main colors you're playing. So what are our mana fixing options? We have the five allied dual colored lands, Evolving Wilds is huge, and some artifacts that filter or produce any color mana like the Celestis, Mystic Skull, Moon Silver Key, and Crossroads Candle Guide. Green also has options, Dawnheart Rejuvenator, Path to the Festival, and Dire Strain Rampage. Yes, this last one has a lot of text, but basically you can blow up any of your lands to get two basics into play tapped, or remove any artifact or enchantment and its controller gets one basic land into play. So it could be a way to ramp just targeting your own clue token, or use it to remove a much more important spell on your opponent's side of the board, and they get a land in return. I think splashing is worth it in this set. It can really up your deck's power level, and although I feel the most comfortable going forward in green, the lands and artifacts make it doable in any color pair. Now let's get into the deck building tips, because there's a lot to digest in this set. My template for this one is pretty straightforward. 15 to 18 creatures, with the majority of them being 2 and 3 drops. I aim for 5 to 6 creatures at both mana values, and then a handful of higher costed creatures to curve into later on. If I'm in an aggro deck like black red, white black, or maybe red green, I'm less concerned about my creature's toughness. But if I'm in something like blue green or blue black, I want to make sure I have multiple early plays with 3 or more toughness, because these are essential to buying me time to get into that mid and late game and not get overrun by aggro or zombie attackers. Blue white probably doesn't mind trading because they have the disturbed creatures, but with there being so much removal, especially in the aggro decks, the lower curve and higher toughness plays give us the best chance to outscale those aggro decks. 
I also like a slightly lower curve in this set because just adding one thing or doing one thing at a time feels like how most players fall behind in a close game for two main reasons. Either you're unable to keep it daytime, so the werewolves are chewing you up, or your opponent has a few removal spells, so they're able to answer that one big play you have, and they're just able to keep the board state in their favor. Speaking of removal spells, I want at least four or five removal spells at a minimum in my deck. If I only have one or two in a color pairing, I'm going to look for another color pairing, because I just don't think that's a recipe for success. Remember, we can't block with our decaying creatures, and we're going to need those removal options for the bigger stuff, as well as those high synergy plays our opponent has. And then I recommend the standard 17 lands, but I'll go 18 if I'm splashing, especially if I'm in blue-green, leaning into four or five color fun stuff. Okay, now for gameplay tips, looking at the archetype game plans we have, this set will definitely not be as aggressive as our last set, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. But we still want to be adding to our board early, because if this winds up being a really grindy format, or games are often somewhat close because of us throwing decaying zombie matter at each other, one or two life points could make the difference. So add to the board early, whether it be for offense or defense. Next, use removal and your hit points wisely. Most color pairs really come together and hit their stride in the mid and late game. Using your life as a resource will be critical in the set and something I'll often do with early attackers. Be wary of combat tricks too, since a lot of our early plays are the higher synergy ones. Risking them in combat is not something I'm a fan of unless I want the creature to die for some reason or I need it in the graveyard. Remember, every color has multiple instant speed options at one or two mana. Blue also has three counter spells, although they cast three or four mana, so keep that in mind. And red has the most instant speed interaction. The benefit here to applying pressure early is it can make your opponent have to play out their removal or combat trick earlier than they'd like, which protects your later game plays too. It also feels good to see your three drops trade up or draw out that unconditional removal, only to follow it up with a much bigger problem and see that look on your opponent's face and you know they don't have an answer. Of course, they'll probably just top deck something and you'll have a great play. That means nothing, but you can't get rattled by that. You just got to play your best magic. And then my last tip is always have fun. This is a pre-release. If this is your first time on Innistrad like it is for me, enjoy the dark and scary journey we're going on in this midnight hunt. Hopefully we're the hunters, not the hunted. To wrap this up, we got to shout out the patrons. If you want to become one of the coolest people on the planet, check out my Patreon because they're the ones who make this content possible. And of course, shout out to the channel sponsor, Card Kingdom. That's the best place to go on the internet to find all your Midnight Hunt or other MTG needs. Hit those like and subscribe buttons because they really do help. And please come back and tell me in the comments how your pre-release went. I always love reading about how y'all got a sweet win or what awesome pulls you had. Thank you all for watching. Hope this video helps you in taking down your pre-release. We'll see you in the next video, my friends. Take it easy and good luck. Peace.